This is CyberSound, your simplified and fundamentals-focused source for all things cybersecurity, with your hosts, Jason Pufall and Stephen Mareska. Welcome to CyberSound. I'm your host, Jason Pufall. Uh, joining me as always is Steve Mareska and Matt Fasaro. Hey, guys. Hey there. Hi. Uh, so today, I think we're going to spend some time uh, dispelling the common myth of what a hacker is. So, uh, and, and this is where it's hard for me, because if I, if I had a you know, say a video or a PowerPoint. I I put a picture up right now of you know maybe a, a guy in a hoodie. Uh, maybe I put even some <laughs> some fancy like Matrix style text in the back, right? And uh, and say, well, you know, this is what everybody thinks of. And certainly, this is what TV teaches everybody that hacker is right. Oh, Probably yeah. a twenty year old, right? We love twenty year olds in their basement, incredibly sophisticated, doing really fancy things. Twelve screens, twelve <laughs> with yeah. tons of screens. Yeah, right? you can't forget the text projecting onto their face, which. Mm-hmm. For some reason, very important. Well, it makes them look sinister. Energy drinks everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Mountain Dew, right? That's, that's a big Mountain one. Dew for sure. The yeah. more sugar, the better. Uh, I mean, that is, but that is the TV, <laughs> and, and and they can get into any organization in seconds. Every time, oh yeah, right. Every yeah. time they've hacked the firewall. <laughs> the fire, yeah. right, that firewall, uh, and then I think you know, juxtapose that with, I think what we would say would be the more common reality now, right? Not to say there's not you know, somebody who thinks it's interesting and, and does in fact wear a hoodie, but you know, the, the office building, the, the organized, you know, sort of business setting cubicles with management where they define what they're going to do f- as an attack objective and they execute against that. Can't forget mm-hmm. the call centers too. And the legit, I mean, <laughs> yeah. th- that's not tongue in cheek, legitimate call centers, right. For the mm-hmm. ransomware stuff that we see. So much more and much more organized, uh, much more driven by, I mean, profit as a motivation for sure. Some kind of an economy, right? Some but kind. Whether it's just like pure financial reasons or a war machine, if you will. You know, they, 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 there's lots of reasons why they form these groups now. So, so, so I want the image I want though, because I, I, I want to segue into the motivation even more. Yeah. I think there's at least a few motivators. I do want to make sure that people have in mind an organized entity, right? Whether that's an office building or whatever you picture is that, but not a random actor doing random things. So why do we have the image of a random actor? I mean, it comes from somewhere, right? I mean, I feel like it comes from 1980 when people were saying, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do some basic phone dialing. And, you know, it was, a, it right. was a little bit more born out of creativity. Phone freaking. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like somebody was like, hey, I just got my computer for the first time and I bought my 1200 baud modem or whatever they might have at the time. <laughs> and we're doing creative things. And, and I think that's where that came from. And it just sort of has stuck. Yeah. I mean, these days we, we kind of hate the term or how they're using the term hacker. Right. I mean, we, we internally usually refer to it as an attacker, not a hacker. Right. Right. Um, Because that's what they're doing. They're, they're attacking. They're not, uh, when we think of hacking, we think of it as trying to learn how a system works. It's it's the same reason a mechanic learns their trade by taking their engines apart and putting them back together. Right. It's kind of the same thing for us, except our engines involve computers. And, and actually, as a term, it started there, realistically. Right. It shifted in the 80s and 90s, and then, frankly, kind of shifted back. You know, hacking these days, at least for, for many of the, the younger crowd, is a positive thing. It's, it's complex at the end of the day. The imagery is warranted in many cases. Um, you know, it used to be that a hacker or attacker was trying to achieve notoriety. They were trying right. to have fame attached to their activities. They were claiming a trophy. Um, or they were trying to make a point. Those were individual actors a lot of the time. Um, so, uh, so are we comfortable then right now saying let's let's not use the word hacker for the purpose of this, of this discussion? Because I think in a way you just described hacking as, and and I think it's reasonable as a, as yep. a positive activity, right? Trying to learn something through, uh, you know, taking something apart and, and understanding I, it better. I think it's okay to have recognition that there are simply multiple definitions. Right. Uh, that's fair. Um, that everything can be used positively and negatively. The negative connotation of the attacker is still reasonable. Everyone, you know, casually, colloquially refers to hackers as attackers. That's fine. Okay. Um, I think that the motive is important, though. Like I said, notoriety, fame, that was what it was at the time when they were, in fact, single actors. Um, it's shifted. It's profitable now right. to attack. Therefore, it's more organized. Therefore, it's more business oriented and planful. That's today's reality. Um, you know, we deal with uh, ransomware incidents where it's very obvious to us that the initial entry 
into some company happen with group A. And then group yeah. B walks in the door with wildly different tactics and tools to take the data or to encrypt system. There are teams and there are marketplaces attached to right. this. That's the economy I think that Matt's exactly. referring to. Right. Right. It's, it's lucrative to break in and then sell access to other groups. That's, that's today's reality. And they can be efficient because their whole job is to break in, right? They're not trying to execute all their attacks. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and then sell that access. Right. So yeah. there are a couple other contexts, you know, of the hacker. Um, some are the hacktivists that are trying mm -hmm. to achieve some sort of social goal or good, depending upon how you, you look at it. They're exposing things that are shadowy, like the, um, you know, exposure of dark money in countries that are right. uh, tax shelters and things of that variety. Um, there's also the researcher. Um, we, in our field, know a variety of them, but one of the most well-known is LOFT, spelled L0PHT. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a group of researchers that, you know, briefed Congress on some very, very important uh, risks to the national security of the U.S. Um, 20 years ago. Today, they're graying. Their long hair has been replaced by yeah. something clean cut and corporate. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, it that's another element of this. And honestly, cybersecurity is built upon the research of curious people trying to understand how systems yeah, are built. Yeah, I'd say this industry would be decades back if we didn't embrace that that kind of culture, right? The the culture of breaking things to fix them, right? Right. So, you know, Steve, you mentioned loft in the in the research space. Uh, any any notable groups would you tie towards say the, you know, the profit motivator or maybe the hacktivist motivated that, you know, if, if anybody wanted to look up, they could they could do a little research. And I mean, there's tons of stuff that came out about Conti recently, you know, with, with everything that's going on in Russia, there's supposedly lots of Russian ties and communications that got leaked. So if you want to see the internals, supposedly, of uh, a ransomware group, it's probably probably the best information you're going to get, really. Uh, there's not a ton that you're going to be able to access. Um, you'll see some research reports from, you know, the, the usuals like the Sophos and um you know, CrowdStrike, yeah, FireEye, they have reports that they, they blog about. You can go to their blogs and search them and find out about certain actors. They post them quite often. Right. I mean, other, you know, topical groups of, of uh, recent notoriety include Lapsus, um, which mm -hmm. is, you know, a, a little different. It, it was portrayed in the news as being um, uh, backed by a teenage mastermind, which is perhaps more of the traditional uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, hacker that, that we're trying to say is less common these days, but they were still a group, right. loosely organized, of course. But, you know, the fact is that they were trying to achieve, achieve goals through coordinated action. Right. Yeah. It, so what kind of inspired this whole segment is we, um, we saw a story that came out uh, yesterday, so May 16th um, from this recording, um, that a hacker was exported or not exported <laughs> I, I keep saying it a hacker hacker was uh extradited from uh, venezuela and uh turns out that he was a cardiologist in venezuela and he had made uh he was associated with jigsaw uh, so if anyone's familiar with that it's a, i think it's an older ransomware group but he had made software to support a, what a lot of these um these other groups have have formed. Uh, he made software to encrypt and manage the uh, the attacks that were going on. Uh, touted that it was used by um, Iran and their hacking groups. Uh, I I I love the names that he used for himself too. Yeah, that that was probably led authorities right to him, like uh, Asclepius and Osophoros and Nebuchadnezzar and all that. Right. Yeah, I mean, they're, <laughs> so they're some good health, names. health ones, right. health related names. <laughs> The, you know, going back to the very beginning where we said that that traditional idea of an attacker or a hacker is a 20 year old kid. Uh, I think that's not the case here. Yeah. Uh, th this guy was 55 years old, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, dispelling that myth that everybody has to be, you know, some young, young, young person with lots of time on their hands. Right. I mean. He's a cardiologist, theoretically pretty busy, and yet found a, a, a fairly lucrative side business. Yep. Yeah, it, it's definitely, it kind of breaks the mold of what you would, you would, you would naturally think of an actor. Totally right? does. <laughs> um, 
And, you know, it, and, and an interesting sort of difference when thinking about lapses, right? Which is, you know, in that case, it was that seven, theoretically, that 17 year old mastermind of the whole thing, right? Right. But, it, you know, the cardiologist, you know, he was not a lone actor per se. He was building tools right. to facilitate others right. in their specialization to achieve greater impact. And training on his tools, like providing right. you know, mm -hmm. service on the side. Oh, yeah. These, these groups are whole service businesses. They have like SaaS solutions that they've created. Um, so it's a whole, whole marketplace. <laughs> yeah, it, it's re it is really fascinating. The, um, so we talked a little bit about, you know, the, the idea of the profit, the, of the profit behind it, right? And I think may, maybe a little bit on sort of the hacktivism space, you know, some, some of the politically motivated or, or whatever the case might be. Um, you know, there, there is, and, and I think with loft, right. Maybe to some degree that, that concept of, a of the white hat versus black hat, right. We didn't really talk about sort of how the industry tends to think of these, uh, you know, where the, the white hat is probably more the hacker who's trying to uh, identify the security flaw or some sort of security vulnerability for the purpose of your responsible disclosure and then ho hopefully getting it fixed. Right. Yeah. Th these yeah. come from, you know, uh, traditional, uh, symbols like white horse, black horse type um, of origin, the, the white hats are pure academic researchers. They're intending to stay within the full realm of benign law, not stray over any um, red lines and produce meaningful research for consumption by others, maybe to improve the overall common good, but by building labs, not by testing out their theories in public and right. things of that variety. The other end of that spectrum, the black hat, their motives are usually far more um, tainted with malice. Mm. They may justify them based on some sort of improvement or hacktivism or social good, but the truth is that they are um, not obeying laws. They are attacking other organizations. They are trying to make a point. Gray hats, they're the middle ground. You know, they're, they're folks who generally have positive um, tendencies. They're trying to improve things, but maybe demonstrate the point by attacking systems publicly in a way that doesn't impact them negatively. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't remember the exact uh, scenario, but I know that there was a, a few people that were actually going and um, upgrading ISP routers and leaving messages inside of them. Like, Hey, there's a huge flaw here. We've, mm. we fixed it for you. Right. So I'm sure they would consider themselves a gray hat. Um, I gotta be honest, you, you don't really hear that terminology too much anymore. No, not a lot. It's, it's kind of gone from, from the industry. I, I think there's a lot of reasons why. Yeah, but, absolutely. But yeah, it's, uh, if you hear them, you know, that would be the difference, but it's not used too much anymore. So the, I think the intention of this, of this discussion, you know, one, I think we thought it was interesting, you know, read, reading about the cardiologist yeah. turned, you know, attacker slash hacker. Uh, but I think the other is really to dispel that myth that, you know, hackers are sort of these lone actors just doing things, you know, for fun or to be a little devious, right? I think we really, we really do want to change that mindset or, so that people think of it as a profit-based exercise. Because I think too often we're engaged in conversations where, you know, our clients will say things like, well, I, you know, we don't have data that makes us an attractive target, for example. And, and in the profit motivation, it isn't about finding classified data from the government to rebuild airplanes in Russia. I mean, you know, that of course exists, but it is very much, can we, can we impact or hamper a business's productivity such that they'll pay us some money to get productivity back? Or, you know, to extend that point, uh, break into a, a company that has no data, that has no systems, that has no speedy connection to the internet, but does have trust in another industry so that right. they can be impersonated. That's sufficient to achieve other attacks. So it's, it's more complicated and textured than merely, hey, I have something of value. And that, that point is really critical when talking about, I don't have anything that is worth being attacked. That's just not the case in most organizations because you know trust is central to cybersecurity. And if it can be abused in any capacity, it is as impactful as theft of data or interruption of revenue for that matter. Right. Yeah, most, most of those places are probably selling themselves short. I mean, you're in business for a reason. You're in something right. valuable. There's probably something to be exploited there. Right. <laughs> and, and, and if, you know, if, even if, if it's just a fulfillment 
business, right? You ship, shipping and receiving, and they can bring that down. Like you, yeah. you're done uh, until you can fix it. So uh, backing up, like, why do we care about yeah. the, the definition of a hacker? I, personally, when we're dealing with an incident, it matters to us to understand the motives because it means that we know potentially what systems are being targeted, what data is being extracted. If we can divine that, there's a better sense of our ability to convey that attack to outside entities as well right. as uh, defend an organization again in the future. Yeah, it's it's the same reason why why the FBI went down the behavioral path, you know, what was that, 20 years ago or so? Um, and it produced good results. We, we do the same thing. We try to identify behaviors that attach to a group. Right. So that we can right. attribute those types of attacks. And make your investigation more meaningful and, and make the discussions you're having with the, the victim more meaningful, right? Because right. it gives them some sense of you know, why us and what was the potential impact. So, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I think that seems like a reasonable place to wrap up, right? Just, just trying to drive home that there's a bunch of different motivators out there for sure. Um, profit really probably being the biggest one that we see today. Uh, and it, and that it isn't, you know, that it isn't just that individual, right? These are, these are pretty well orchestrated attacks, uh, typically aimed at making some money. And there, and frankly, there's an entire uh, underground economy, you know, maybe for lack of a better term of uh, surrounding these things. Uh, and in, you, know, you don't want to bury your head in the sand to pretend you're not going to be a potential victim. I mean, it's why we talk about things like security fundamentals and some of the you know, technical controls and, and programmatic improvements that we, that we discuss all the time. Um, so with that, you know, if anybody wants to chat a little bit more about your general uh, sort of cybersecurity or you know, the, the, the hacker space, uh, you know, we have a fair amount of experience there through a lot of the incident response work that we've done. You know, reach out to us at LinkedIn at Vancord or you know, Vancord Security at Twitter, and we'll happy to keep the conversation going. Uh, and with that, you know, we hope somebody got some value out of this and found it interesting, and uh, we appreciate everybody listening. Stay vigilant. Stay resilient. This has been CyberSound.